a very warm welcome to all of you to the European Development Days and this special session on Youth Action on Biodiversity. It gives me great pleasure to welcome literally thousands of you, thousands of you across the globe from Asia, America, Africa and everywhere in between obviously and mainland Europe. Um, it's a real pleasure to be uh, in this session with you. My name is Damendra Kanani. I'm, I'm one of the directors at Friends of Europe and a chief spokesperson of the organization. This session has been uh, co-organized with the Africa EU Foundation and the Global Youth uh, Diversity Network. And we have people from that network and others from across the place to discuss this very important issue. We will be joined uh, very shortly with, uh, by our commissioner, uh, European commissioner, Jutta Urpelainen, who has uh, played a very active role in, di in discussions around youth action on this agenda. Um, just a few words about the importance of this particular issue and this item. You know this better than I, that our temperatures are rising higher than ever before. It's the hottest decade, hottest year uh, on record. We know that the species that matter to our global plan economy uh, and our ecology and our planet Earth are being outstripped and you know wiped out uh, before our eyes. You can see what's happening to forests. You can see what's happening to our soil. You can see what's happening to our air pollution, etc and so forth. There is an interdependency between what grows in our soil, the quality of our soil, what we do with it, how we eat, what we do, what we do with trash, rubbish and how we consume. This is about, at the heart of it, your inheritance as young people, but about what you do about it now and into the future. This is about what you pass on also. This session isn't about playing, paying lip service to young people. Those of you who have been involved in youth consultations will only know too well. Often you're a sideshow, you're there as voyeurs uh, and consulted but never taken account of. This is your opportunity as young people to have a say on what should politicians do in terms of priorities and activities, behaviours and commitments and following through on this issue of biodiversity and this is why this session is critically important to have young people from across the globe to share with you share with each other but also uh, Commissioner Jutta Urbelainen to express articulate vent your frustrations if so but also pose what you think should be on the to-do list of global leaders as they have a critical year ahead this is a very important year where we have a number of multilateral meetings on the issue of climate in particular cop 15 but then we also have glasgow also coming up but this is your chance to have a say on what matters so it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all warmly to this conversation so what i want to do is before the commission arrives is to um, gauge your views uh, and there's going to be a well, I'm going to uh, introduce a few questions on you can see the Slido app on your screen beside your, your, your image I want you to be able to look at the question there and this, these questions aren't just uh, for a warm-up act these are absolutely important and critical to understand what you're feeling thinking and what you want off this agenda and from for yourselves also so do you think politicians are doing enough at the right pace to ensure global diversity protection this is important about whether you think the actions match the words of politicians so fill that in so we want to make sure that you all get a chance from across the world to answer this particular question um, so make sure you do fill it in so let's move on to the next question. Um, we obviously will show the results. You can see them on your screen also. It's quite interesting and quite startling, uh, your view on whether politicians are actually doing enough. 67% are saying no. So nearly 70% of you across the world are saying they're not. Let's move on to the next question. Um, it should pop up, right. This is about you. Uh, you can read it directly. You know, are you given enough space to, pl uh, to play uh, and act and to activate other communities um, in taking a transformative role on biodiversity. Do you think you have enough space? Yes, no, could you do more? Fill those scores in, fill those, uh, press those buttons. Uh, and then we'll come back to them, obviously. So there we go, there we go. Over 50% of you feel 
that actually you don't have enough space. Uh, a third of you do. Um, and actually, you know, less than 20% of you feel you could do more. Let's come back to some of these issues because that's quite interesting. Let's go to the next one. And this is about governments. So our, what should governments prioritise in the years to come? Uh, as I said, this year is a critical one, but actually the next 10 years are also absolutely essential in terms of action. So should they do more to protect and re, uh, restore ecosystems, move towards a climate neutral and circular economy, stop harmful subsidies, make our food systems more sustainable? Fill those fill those in. Again, this is important. This is about national governments. What should they be doing? What should governments across the world focus on, uh, prioritise? So th there we go. We have the results here. So what we have here in terms of what governments should prioritise, absolutely clear that nearly 60% of you are saying move towards a climate neutral uh, and circular economy um, with a close obviously second to other areas which are absolutely important uh, around protecting and restoring ecosystem. What's interesting is only 10% of you are saying stop harmful subsidies. What's that about? Uh, let's think about that because subsidies often are the levers for change or obstacles for change. So let's think about what your views are on subsidies. So it'll be interesting to see what your thoughts are and also bring in the views of our young leaders from across the play, across the world. We have, we have four of them on the menu for you this afternoon. This e well, I can't say this afternoon because you're from all over the world. So at this particular time in the day for you, uh, we're going to bring four voices from all over the world to share their thoughts on what should happen, what should be the actions. And so we have a range of a range of speakers. We have Sweta. Um, uh, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Sweta. Uh, you're from the Global South Focal Point. We have Hamid Arum Harab, uh, youth leader, climate change of Indonesia, and you're also one of the European Development Day's young leaders. Also, we have Simangele um, Mswele, senior manager of youth leadership program, African Wildlife Foundation. Uh, we have Melina Melina Sakiyama. Founder and coordinator of the Youth Voices Capacity Building Empowerment Program, Global Youth Diversity Network. Um, and then obviously we have, uh, there's not obviously about it, sorry, we have Christian Sampa, who is our pre who's the president and CEO of Wildlife Conservation Society and member of the high level working group on biodiversity set up by the European Commission, which drafted eight, there are eight recommendations on this agenda. So those are the people that we have on the menu to engage you, stimulate you, uh, provoke you, and to help you think about what should be on the agenda uh, in this momentous year uh, for biodiversity. And don't forget, as I said earlier, don't be shy, be brave, um, be honest, because uh, actually if this is going to move in, in, in earnest, what you should expect is the opportunity to be heard, to have your voices articulated, but more importantly, to be able to track track what politicians are doing. We know in the past five years or so, there's been so much in terms of a double speak uh, between those what, what, what politicians say and what the actions actually happen on the ground. And actually, time has run out for that. So let's come back to all of that and we'll come back to some of the polls. But now I have a great opportunity to welcome Commissioner uh, Jutta Urpelainen to the stage. Uh, sorry, you've just uh, uh, come into this little slight private moment. It's not a private moment. You, <laughs> Therapy and I have been having a virtual relationship, and I mean that in the best way. Um, we've been uh, facilitating um, what we call the Africa EU uh, debate, the, the Af Debating Africa series, all last year and some earlier this year, where we've been engaging citizens from both Europe. Uh, continental Europe and Africa on subjects that matter to them and it's been a joy but this is the first <laughs> time in our Covid times that her and I have actually seen each other exactly. and met each other so it's lovely to, lovely to meet you yes <laughs> sorry uh, there's about 10,000 folk out there but that's okay okay um, but no it's a joy it's a real joy <laughs> but I'm sure all of you have experienced this moment where suddenly we have the opportunity to see people that we've not really been engaged with whether that's family friends professionals so it's a great opportunity to have as we eke our way out of COVID and, and lockdowns to be able to get back to some form of human interaction that's normal-ish. So, Yuta, it's a very, real pleasure to welcome you. You are someone, and those of you who are not aware, um, 
this is a brand new commission with a very different uh, approach. And uh, by that I mean it's the first time we have more women in power in governance than ever in the history of the European Commission. We have a team EU approach that is genuinely uh, gender balanced. And now I can't go behind the scenes in terms of whether that actually matters, but what we know from <laughs> neuroscience is that it matters more if you have more women in the room to reach better decisions. Uh, we know that. It's a, it's a scientific fact, if you will, to a certain extent. So it gives me great pleasure to ask uh, Yuta to share with us her views. She's someone who has... And, from this is my perspective, has listened hard, um, acted, and the most important thing, for, uh, I think, for me is that her political behaviour is such that she's created opportunities for young people to engage directly with her and have a youth sounding board over, over time. You should, so I know that was a bit of a love-in, but over to you. <laughs> That's not I mean that I'm going to be non-challenging towards you, but lovely to hear from you about what you, why you think this is important and how you're going to take this forward. Thank you, Darmedra, and it's so great to be here with you and, and, and sorry for being a bit late, but I was, um, uh, I was respecting the democracy because I was serving uh, the European Parliament. I, we had a geopolitical dialogue, so that's the reason why I'm a bit late. But it's good to see, uh, of course, you, but uh, it's good to be here with all these talented young people. And I, I also see some familiar faces because we had a already very very nice session together and it was so empowering i was so impressed you know how talented young people uh, we are having here in the european development days today uh, of course european union is committed to halting uh, greenhouse gas emissions reversing biodiversity biodiversity loss and cutting pollution and we are also taking very seriously uh, the necessary steps to do so through our European Green Deal. And as you know, the European Green Deal is our ambitious growth strategy. We are all committed to the two, uh, 2030 Agenda, so Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Our European deal, our European Green Deal, will help us become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. Every second of inaction has consequences. And I think this is actually the topic we haven't discussed that much, that how much it costs if we don't do anything. One million species on the planet are at the risk. So no matter our efforts within the EU, we can not do it alone. This is a global problem and global action is also needed. And this is why I will step up relations with our partner countries. You know that I'm responsible for 126 countries. So I am step up the relations with our partner countries around the world to support them in this green and inclusive transition. And how, do, how to do that? We do that through the dialogue, but also through the financial support. And this was one of the topics I discussed with the European uh, member of the European Parliament today, that how to allocate our financial support to our partner countries in order to support also the green transition in their societies. As we all know, this year definitely will be an important year for nature. Ahead of the biodiversity COP15, that will take place in October in Kumni. We are also mobilizing our efforts for the adoption of an ambitious global biodiversity framework. We need measurable, actionable and time-bound targets, as well as strong implementation monitoring and review process. So we need to look at mobilizing more funds because we also need money, but also better governance and regulations. We also need to ensure that this transition is inclusive. And I think, Ramandra, that that's, that might be the one of the topics today's discussion, that how to make sure that different kind of people, also young people, are able to participate, that they feel that the process is really inclusive, that they, their, their voice is really heard. 
but also with the full participation of indigenous people and local communities, because I think it's important that we also engage with the local authorities, local communities. Dear friends, 91% uh, of young Africans and Europeans stated in the hashtag Your Voice, Your Future campaign that they want to be more involved in this decision making. And uh, actually, I heard this call. And uh, therefore, I'm very delighted to announce that I have decided, as you said already, I have decided to establish a youth sounding board. And can you imagine, we received 4,500 applications for that youth sounding board. Wow. Really, worldwide. So I think it's a great example that really young people, they want to participate. They want to be, you know, uh, to be on board. And this sounding board will provide a platform for young people's direct input on policies, strategies and tools in EU external action, including in the area of the Green Deal. And this is not the, uh, the only thing we are preparing. We are also preparing a youth action plan. It will allow for a more coordinated approach to ensure youth is included and empowered across all our relevant instruments and policies. So young people are really the driving force in finding innovative solutions to address climate change and biodiversity loss. And as we soon will hear, you young people can also inspire us and push us to do more. So I'm very delighted to be here. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to listening to these uh, young, talented uh, uh, people around the world and, and, of course, learning from them as well. Jutta, thank you very much. Um, really important numbers there. Um, a very powerful woman, clearly. 127 countries, relationships. So, you know, someone that can influence what the tone and rap rapport is and the kind of political signals you give to countries in your relationship about the importance of this agenda. And, um, you know, it's clear that you're going to do that. But also the fact that in the days where we think that young people are not engaged, over 4,000. Wow, that's, mm. that's phenomenal. And there's a huge, if you like, a kind of a mandate. But today, as I understand it, we have nearly 10,000 people logged on today. So this is a huge opportunity to really engage. But more importantly, you know, all of us find it very easy to deconstruct the problem. We're very good at saying what the problem is. We're mm -hmm. very poor at saying how we should change things or what the solutions are. So let's make this more about solutions rather than saying, actually, this is so bad. This is how politicians are not doing the job, etc. What should they do and what would you like to do? So I'm going to turn to Shweta. Shweta, lovely to have you on uh, again with us. So over to you. I know that you have a particular interest on that foundation building block about behavior and peer pressure, which is about education. Over to you, Sveta, yeah. your views on this agenda. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, I'm delighted to be a part of this conversation today. Um, I would like to start off by telling you my personal story and how I got to this, where I am now. Uh, a few years back, during my master's, I studied the stumptail macaques, which is a rare and endangered primate species that lived in the northeastern part of India. Uh, I really wanted to protect the species and the ecosystem that it lived in. But I soon realized that if I really wanted to truly protect the species and not just keep it in a glorified zoo, I actually needed to protect the landscape that it lived in, which included the people around the park that lived in poverty. So to really understand how could I go about creating this kind of change that I wanted and conserve the species, I, I, I've started realizing, and this is something a lot of young people are realizing, is that we need to find a way to provide equity for people and nature in order to be able to protect this kind of the, the, the ecosystem and the landscapes that we live in. And several young people are realizing this, not just me. Uh, and this is what we have realized is a way that we need to move towards a future. We see that a vision for our future and the, what we want for our future is uh, to be able to live in a world that is equitable, sustainable, just, and inclusive so that we can actually live in harmony with nature. But we also know that the current economic model and the current practices and business as usual is not going to get us there. Uh, if we continue with the same profit first, same economic models, the same practices, the same values, and the same behaviors, we are not going to change the system. And we know that this is a systemic problem that we have right now. So if we really need to stop the same, 
it means that we need to be able to go towards what is best, which is the Intergovernmental Panel for uh, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services is saying, uh, we need to go towards transformative change, which for the people who don't know about it, is a fundamental and structural change in the way our society works and functions, which means that we need to realign our values, our behaviors, our priorities, and our actions. Well, by just saying it, it clearly sounds like something that is not easy to do. Exactly. And so say it. So what, you, what is it you want? <laughs> yes, so that is where I'm going to help. It is definitely something which is not easy. And this is something we in the Global Youth Biodiversity Network have been asking thousands of young people, saying how do we go towards this vision that we want through transformative change and what needs to happen? And what we are clearly hearing young people have echoed is as one way that our youth priority that we need to push for is education. Mm -hmm. Because we see that education can actually have a fundamental role in shaping the way we change our values, our knowledge systems, our skills, but also even uh, have a critical role in shaping culture across the globe. And with this uh, critical role that education has, we need to have transformative education that is actually going to go away from, you know, exploitive practices it is going to be going away, uh, shape our values, behaviors, and priorities in a way that we go away from these exploitive practices that we have, then towards living in harmony with nature. The second thing we need is to also go away from, you know, gender discrimination, gender stereotyping, which, uh, you know, you guys have already talked about, and I'm really happy to hear that the commission is doing this already, but we also need to go away from cultural, racial, and social discrimination that exists in the world, and we need to go towards intergenerational learning. We need to go towards inclusive and, uh, you know, indig uh, including uh, in indigenous and uh, local knowledge systems in our current education models. The education needs to be open to all. And, you know, these are some of the key things that we see are important. Another thing that we really uh, think is critical is that we need to understand and we need the world to see that this is a, a systemic problem, that the biodiversity loss is connected with the social struggles that exist in the world today. And uh, for us to be able to understand, respect, and value nature and all that it offers us, we need to understand that in this interlinkage. But at the same time, we need to know that we cannot have uh, our future generations or the current generations uh, continue to learn this in a siloed approach. We can't just have uh, education being taught in environmental science or natural sciences. Uh, we can't just have biodiversity conservation taught in these sectors, but actually it needs to be cross-cutting. It needs to be done in all levels and in all relevant subjects if we really want to create the change. It also needs to happen in all ages. So therefore, we are able to reskill our current workforces to have more sustainable practices. We all know that this kind of change that young people are talking about is also something which is going to take time. But we see that the formal education and the formal curricula can play a role, but there will be gaps in achieving this vision for transformative education. And we see the informal and non-formal education sector playing a critical role in actually building this re relationship with nature and biodiversity and complementing what is happening. So now, uh, having said what young people are echoing very clearly, we want mm. is transformative education. Okay. And if we want this, it basically means that you know, we need to push our world leaders to understand the true potential that transformative education holds. And we need to find uh, work with them to really push for this in all multilateral environmental agreements, as well as the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And I hope that all of you can join us today, including the commissioner, to help us stop the same and transform our education to transform our future and our world. Thank you. Sweta, thank you so much. A great manifesto for change. I know the rest of you, we're gonna, I know time, our hour will fly past, but I fly <laughs> past. So, but I want to make sure that, you know, uh, uh, Yuta can come in and respond directly to something, you know, a set of very important points. Yuta. <laughs> yes, I, I, I fully agree with you because uh, education is the most powerful key uh, or measure to be used if we really want to change the attitudes, but also the societies. And, um, and that's why I have decided to increase our funding to education. So that uh, in the previous years, we spent approximately 7% of our external funding to education. But now I have decided to increase that to be at least 10%. So hopefully we can go even beyond, but you know, this is the, this is the main priority area we are, we, we are going to focus on in, the, in our future uh, programming. So, so definitely we will invest in education, girls' education. Critical. 
basic education, but also teacher training, because we also need to change the teacher's attitude. So I think uh, that's also the priority, especially, I mean, in Africa, there is a need for almost 20 million new teachers by the year 2030. So that's uh, one of the priorities. And then of vocational education and training. So we are on board. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I want to go to um, Hamid. Um, Hamid, you're in Indonesia. Thank you. A very warm welcome to you. You have a particular challenge, and a particular issue you want to raise about orangutans, but also palm oil. Two issues which might not be connected, but are hugely connected. Over to you. Thank you, moderator. Greetings, everyone. I'm Hamid Arumarahab. I live in one of the most biodiverse hotspots on planet Earth, the tropical rainforest of Sumatra. In 2017, scientists discovered a new species of Tsapanuli orangutan in the Batang Tori ecosystem. The world is starting to talk about the Tsapanuli orangutan. Their status is the most critically endangered grid F on Earth. Imagine less than 800 orangutans live in area the size of London, but it's fragmented into three complex forests and surrounded by the extractive industries such as hydro dam development, gold mining, oil palm plantations, geothermal projects, and not to mention human orangutan conflicts. Tapanuli orangutan is a picture of our biodiversity crisis nowadays, a critically endangered species in a critically fragmented habitat. If we don't save them and their habitat, they may be the first great apps to be extinct in a time of climate crisis. As Tapanuli people, we have not succeeded in saving our economy. Why should we save Tapanuli orangutans? This is my question back then. But when I work as a pet researcher for local communities, I finally understand we, the local peoples, depend on the forest and its ecosystem services. From provision services to regulating and cultural services provided by the biodiversity. And the orangutan, which literally means the people of the forest, ensures the sustainability of ecosystem services. This is why, the for, this is why for the last six years, I involved in climate action. I keep educating young people because it is so simple to understand the connection between them and us. My initiative is bring the local issue and local knowledge to the youth and biodiversity education, but also including them into scientific knowledge and global context, such as how biodiversity work as nature-based solution for climate change. Apart from educating young people, I'm also doing research about forest ecosystem services for local people, campaigning and advocating for biodiversity issues in Indonesia, speaking to the media, government, and conference after conference. We need the biodiversity, therefore we need to protect them. But when it comes to protecting biodiversity and its ecosystem services, we know it is complicated. We are failed to value our biodiversity and we are failed to save them. However, we did not hear much of failed stories of conservation. What is shown in reports and media are ten to success stories from conservationists around the world. Yet the reality on the ground is our biodiversity is decreasing faster than ever before. Talking about the biodiversity crisis is not enough if we don't involve youth at the core of action and policy. We need to give the youth access to funding and empower them. Listen to the local knowledge and understand the local context and involve local youth to implement it. Let's move to our bigger perspective. The biodiversity issue is intersectional issue. Genociding one species are also genociding the culture and harming the socioeconomic for people. We, the future generation, value biodiversity as a legacy because without them we will lose the ecosystem and its services. There is no future without biodiversity. We thank the EU for supporting great app conservation such as in Pirunga National Park, Congo. We need to do also for the Tapanuli orangutan, the most critically endangered great apps on earth. We are in a range against time to save biodiversity. We have so many things to do, but here is my priority my priority. That's how the deforestation, but also we have to reconnect the fragmented forest to see the long-term survival of our biodiversity and to answer the ecosystem services for people and the planet. Also, involving the youth for every conservation initiative from the payment ecosystem services, community uh, conservation, and also such as like REDD. Through the EU Green Deal, I call on today's leader to invest in biodiversity and ecosystem services for the future of planet Earth and bring the youth to the core of action. Thank you.
Um, thank you so much. That was very effective uh, to the point. Um, I'm going to, because I'm thinking of time, and so I'll bring you to in later, but if I can move directly on to uh, Simangele. Simangele, thank you very much again for joining us. You have a particular interest in, you know, the, the, the power of people and their capacity and skills. So share with us your thoughts on what should be happening and, you know, focus on, you know, what would you like you to do in terms of the power that she has, but other leaders. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think it's very important to note that we are having this discussion at the time when, for instance, the Convention on Biological Diversity is making the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. But this is not the first time we're going to be having a strategic plan. We've had one before. And one of the things that came out on why we cannot achieve the goals and targets that we had were the financial resources that match the ambition that we have. So I was very happy to hear the commission mentioning the need for more resources to be allocated where necessary. But I would love to add a point and said, sometimes these resources are not easily accessible, especially for developing nations. And if you think of youth groups that do not have enough access to those. So there's a need to ensure that these are relatively easier accessible. The second point is the one we touched on, on capacity building and skills building. When you put a poll earlier on, a lot of young people, for instance, were saying one of the priorities is to restore and protect ecosystems. Once we know we need to do that, then we need to build the skills for people to do that. There's a lot of protected areas currently, and a number of them are not effectively managed. So there's a need to build those skills. If we agree that we need to beef up communication and education, then there's a need to build those skills, invest in building the next generation of storytellers and the next generation of educators. And the last point for me is we need equitable participation of all interested stakeholders as we make these big strategies. We are unfortunately having these discussions in the middle of the pandemic, which means a lot of people are joining this virtually. But we know the negotiation and dialoguing uh, stage is actually not equal. We've seen things that are happening for the CBD and the SPI that a lot of African countries, for example, cannot participate adequately in negotiations and even CSOs in youth groups. So as we have these discussions in the middle of the pandemic, we need to ensure that we are still having equitable participation of all interested and affected stakeholders. Thank you so much. Mangele, thank you so much. Two points, actually. You, think, you and I have experienced this point being made last year. It's a, in our Debating Africa series. The issue about access to funding, the simplicity of it, and actually getting to the parts where it needs to be is key, but the equity of participation between women, men, boys and girls. It's absolutely crucial. And everyone in between is absolutely key. So thank you for making and raising those points. I'm going to move on, uh, if I may, to the, our next contributor, <clears throat> Melina. Very good to have you here. Um, you are some of the, one of the co-founders of the Global Youth Diversity Networks. Uh, thank you very much for setting something oh, such fantastic in place and the fact that it's been going for so many years. Over to you for you to share your thoughts on what should be the priorities for action on biodiversity. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me well. We can I'm indeed. talking from Okay, that's great. I'm talking from Brazil actually, which is also one of the most biodiverse countries in the world and actually it's great to see that every uh, all my colleagues here come from mega diverse countries because um I think one thing that we need to understand about young people and I've been working like with youth empowerment for the past 10 years through the work of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network and we have been already awarded an, a, a a prize for the work, especially on capacity building that we have been doing. And it's a completely bottom up network of like completely engaged people. Mm -hmm. And one thing that is really interesting about this new generation, I, I was, I'm gonna say the millennials and the post millennials is that being born in an already globalized world, we, we get all the impacts, both negative and the positive impacts. So the negative ones being like the competition, like the, the trade, the environmental impacts, the, the sort of like more unequal world and more sort of like uh, difficult 
opportunity, uh, difficult possibilities for young people. We are getting more marginalized because there are fewer job opportunities, fewer, like you have to work much harder, study much more to be able to get a job, to secure a job. Um, but at the same time, we experience all the, com the the sharing of the culture and like the possibility of having many friends around the world and understand how people around the world think. And that also has brought hmm. our communities much closer, right? Gibbon has more than like 140, uh, uh, more than like members from more than 140 countries. We have currently more than 45 chapters spread all over the world collaborating together and working together, right? And like, what is most amazing of all of that is that the mindset is very similar. Mm -hmm. Like young people understand nature, understand biodiversity as something that is completely vital for our livelihoods, mm -hmm. our future, our everything. We understand biodiversity as our identity. You know, it brings us culture. It's connected to our relationship with ourselves, uh -huh. with the people. And what we are seeing, yeah. and I'm from Brazil, and I, 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 I cry almost every day because mm -hmm. I work with environment here. And you see that, like that feeling that we have, mm -hmm. doesn't translate to what is going on. Indeed. And like the reason for that is like the way we are behaving, the system, like our priorities, like that we are valuing probably just money at the moment, just profit, like we have to say what is the truth. Uh -huh. And we are changing everything else, everything that gives us well-being, everything that gives us food, water, like climate regulation, pollination, materials, like well-being, health, mental health, into like just things, right? Things that we can buy and then throw away. So, Melina, I'm going to cut, cut, cut yes. across you because, no, this, sure. is, this is really powerful. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You have an amazing network. You have created a noise and an imprint, an impression across the world. 45 chapters, that's fantastic. What an incredible infrastructure. What do you want from politicians? So, therefore, we know you get it. We know the younger generation gets it. You have a different mindset. You have already the globalised mindset, but you see both the good and the bad, as you've expressed. What do you want from Utah? What do you want from global leaders? You have the COP coming up. Tell us, what are the yes. two or three things you think they should be doing to change the emotion that you feel every day? They need to be able to share their power. Like, we live in a very asymmetric society with power imbalances. So I want politicians to really take representativity, inclusion, very serious. Because at the moment, it's just like, oh, yes, like, oh, yes, we need to, like, make gender balance or regional balance or whatever. But this is done at a very low priority. Mm -hmm. So it means that resources are not getting where they need to get. It means that still participation is tokenized. So they just choose whatever person is there, you know, just to make the quota right instead of really like communicating through the existing networks through the collectives through the infrastructures that are already formed so this is one of the main things the second one is that funding schemes and structures don't don't get to the bottom up right they get lost into all those like in, in numerous like in um sort of systems of like aid or development aid, and then it gets stuck in all those intermediate layers instead of actually reaching the communities, in, instead of actually reaching the people. And why is that? Because it is more difficult. You need to do much more like um, um, empowerment, capacity development. You also need to trust much more. So you need to bring those communities, those young people into planning processes. So you cannot just give money. So you draft your own plans and like your own sort of like projects and then ask the people to join when everything is done and they have not been heard throughout the process. So you need to bring women, youth and indigenous people at the planning levels, okay. at the decision-making levels, so that we can like develop better plans that are more effective and where the money is actually going to do what it needs to be done, right? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. Melina, thank you very much and uh, thank you for, uh, for responding so effectively to my challenge to you. And I think for all of you and those of you who are you know, looking in, watching, listening, uh, again, I encourage you, use the Slido, uh, put in your thoughts, your comments, your specific recommendations. You know, people can say things like inclusion, but what do you mean specifically? What is it you want in terms of a hard recommendations that leaders cannot avoid? It becomes, you know, inarguable. Yuta, over to you in terms of some of your reflections about what you've heard from the, the, the four speakers we've had so far. Yeah, I maybe I would like to comment first the Melina's point on uh, participation and, and, and that how to really engage with young people already at the planning stage. Um, I can ensure you that this, uh, this has been a priority uh, because I have really instructed all our delegations around the world to really consult organize consulting events, debates, uh, discussions with the civil society organizations, but also with the local authorities. And I have specifically uh, instructed them to engage with youth organizations and women organizations, because my idea was that, you know, we need to get their views and, and, and their ideas also to this programming exercise. What is this programming exercise I'm, I'm referring to all the time? Very, uh, in a nutshell, we are going to use around 80 billion, 80 uh, billion euros uh, to external funding, so to the cooperation with our partner countries. And now we are allocating the funding to the different regions, to the different countries, but also to the different policy areas. And uh, one of the main policy areas we are investing a lot is Green Deal. So all the climate related projects and programs. 30%, 3-0, 30% of our funding goes to that. So as, as we discussed in our previous session, I really encourage you to contact also our delegation at the country level because their role is very important in this programming exercise. Even though I have instructed them to consult with young people and organize these meetings, I have to tell you that all of them have not followed my instructions, so I have really maybe, tried to maybe take, take some time. <laughs> put pressure <Absolutely>. towards them. <laughs> so be active at the country level. Excellent. Thank you very much. I want to kind of, we've got a couple of questions on the, on the Slido. So we've got something about, you know, are there any uh, lead or tools to help young people to start changing the approaches to project actions and restoring ecosystems? Um, we've tackled, the, there's something here about actually, how do you get youth, young people more involved in the system, actually as employees or people that are more effectively engaged? And, you know, this, how can we reverse the current uh, in, in incentive of buying at a cheaper price per unit uh, from certain goods that we consume? Because actually at the heart of this is that we know that those of us in the north, west and parts of the east are consuming far too much. Mm. We have uh, far too much. We're greedy, we're throwing stuff away and those in the south are suffering on starvation. And so how do we kind of reverse our, uh, it sounds almost biblical and not, it's not intentional or religious, but there's something about our greed uh, and our desire to have, you know, uh, let's put off uh, today what we can do tomorrow where actually we need to do things today. So there's something about that dynamic that we need to address. Any thoughts and reflections you have on that particular agenda about how do we kind of change some of the systems that we need to be thinking about? You've talked about the country's mm. relationships. The delegation is absolutely key. Mm. Um, this year, in terms of the messages you want to give to COP15, mm. but also mm. Glasgow, we've got the wider agenda. Mm. Any thoughts that you want to share about that in particular? I, I think I, I also... You know, I took the message which was passed, I can't remember which one of you said that, but we need to walk the talk. I mean, that. I, I take it very seriously if young people have this feeling that, yeah, the politicians, they are only t talking, but, you know, not taking a real actions. And um, uh, I think it's a very serious uh, message. And I think especially now when we have really adopted this green deal to be our flagship program, so to say, where we try to combine, uh, you know, growth, but, uh, but at the same time also this uh, climate perspective, so that we have a growth strategy which provides sustainable, uh, also economically sustainable growth. So I think we, in, in a way, we need, to, uh, we need to do more. We need to also... Uh, earn the trust of the young people young people and and i can ensure you that this is something 
at least the Commission is, is really committed to do. Thank you. You know, there's something about them which you have no absolute control about, but there is something about the fact that this agenda requires a coherence across mm. trade, foreign relations, security, international development, mm. the works. And you say you have those relationships, but you know, people watch what part of the Commission may do on a trade deal versus what you do in relation to harnessing relations. Mm. And I'm not to ask you to answer that question, but I think people watch mm. that, unfortunately. And, you know, uh, as they say, um, I use this often with leaders, people watch what you say and hear what you do, uh, if you can put it that way, in, in a sense. But, Christian, can I move to you now? You've been involved significantly and you've drafted these eight recommendations. Share with us your thoughts on what you've heard, but also what you're hoping to achieve, what you think can be achieved this year, this kind of very critical year, uh, where we're coming out of a crisis, well, in the journey out of the crisis, um, and where this agenda could fall off uh, the, uh, the edge, if you like, because we're so, so focused on getting the economies back on their feet. Christian. Well, all right, well, thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be with all of you today and to have an opportunity to hear the voices of the youth on these issues. As you mentioned, I had the opportunity to serve in the high-level panel the biodiversity specifically that came up with these eight recommendations that are going to be presented tomorrow. Um, and, and quickly, in terms of background, I actually grew up in Colombia in South America. I'm a biologist by training, but I've devoted my life to science and conservation and education. So I think there's a, a lot of the messages I'm hearing resonate with us. Um, I'm delighted to hear the points of view uh, that I just heard right now, and I completely agree with them. Uh, that is exactly uh, sort of our approach and some of the recommendations we have. Uh, this will be an absolutely critical decade for us, there is no doubt, for the reasons that were mentioned in the panel. It's an issue around climate, it's original nature, and the third big issue we're facing right now is the pandemic. But what many people don't realize is that these three crises share, have shared problems and shared solutions. So, for example, if you really want to tackle and solve the climate problem, at least one third of that solution has to come from nature. So we have to invest in the protection of ecosystems as a way to solve this. If we want to prevent the next pandemic, we have to tackle the source origin of these things. And 70% of the emerging diseases come from zoonotic diseases that come from animals. So issues like wildlife trade are fundamental issues around this and deforestation and increasing the human wildlife interface. So certainly, as you mentioned, this is going to be a critical year as we enter uh, these big meetings happening fall. And what I really hope is that we can find synergies between them, because usually the biodiversity people talk about them, the climate people that talk about them, the health people talk about some of these issues, but we don't always tackle them together. So this is a moment where we have to shine, uh, really focus on those shared solutions around these issues. And I'm delighted to hear the commissioner emphasizing the emphasis on uh, partnerships, on funding, on building capacity in these countries and empowering young people to do these things, which are absolutely key. And we can go into some of these things in detail. Suffice it to say that some of the recommendations from the high-level panel talk exactly about these issues. So how do we protect some of the most critical, important ecosystems in the planet? How do we look at that in view of climate change? How do we restore connectivity? And by the way, we do a lot of work in Sumatra, so I'm very familiar with that. And that's exactly what uh, was described by Hamid is exactly the kind of solution and framework that we need for these issues. We also talk about issues like restoring ecosystems. And in one of the questions that came up, it's not only about planting trees, it's about restoring, it's about rewilding. It's about really looking at bringing back wildlife communities, uh, livelihoods, ecosystem services. So I think that's critical. So I think a lot of these elements are delighted and uh, I'm just uh, really hopeful that the European Union will really emphasize this in the political agenda. I'm delighted to hear the Commissioner talking about the finance and we're ready to help implement these issues working with local communities and different voices because at the end, what we need is local action. Okay, so local Christian, if I may, people. if I may, I feel as if you've given us a really wonderful introduction, a preface, but I don't know how the how turns into a what. Be specific. What is it you're going to say tomorrow? We've got thousands of people here. What are the two or three things, very briefly, that you expect or you would like to see happen so that we get a sense of, rather than the how we change things, what is it you want? What should be happening? Give us a sense of what it is you're going to be yeah, asking for. I'll give you a sense of some of the issues that are included in there. And again, the whole thing will be reported tomorrow. One of the specific goals that's being pushed right now is what we call the, is protecting 30% of land and sea by 2030. That's one of the key goals that's being discussed. We would really like to see this as a decision 
of the uh, Convention of Biodiversity. The European Union has already endorsed this. Okay. The G7 meeting already did that. That's one example. Thank We'd you. like to see at least 30% of the climate finance go specifically to nature-based solutions. That's another very specific example. So there's a number of specific recommendations in the panel. Thank you for responding. I know you've got to unveil it tomorrow, but hey, you've got a public, this is an issue of transparency and accountability. Engage the audience here, who especially, have, you know, thousands of young people mm. who want to hear what you're going to be saying in, term, you know, in terms of making change on this agenda. But thank you. There are some very specific targets there, about 30%. I heard a lot in terms of spend, but also investment and action. So what I'd like to do um, is to go back to our contributors as, as time is running out. And then, you tell, I'll come back to you yeah, uh, for sure. final words, if that's OK is given what you've heard so far, you've heard um, what Yuta has to say, we've had a, a conversation between you, all of you, and we know that this year, these remaining uh, months that we have, um, are almost a sense of time is running out. We know what we do this year is critical for this decade uh, as we move forward. What would you like? So I want to start with, I know it's difficult, this is, a, this is a hard one, but be as specific as you can be. That can help uh, Yuta, but others as well, and this global community is listening to you. Uh, here's your platform. What would you like? What are the specific things? Sweta, over to you first. So, um, I mean, I think we have kind of echoed this quite clearly, like young people are saying this, and you've heard it throughout the panel today. Uh, some of the critical things that we are pushing for is intergenerational equity, which we think is critical that uh, needs to be put into the policy making processes all over. We also, as I said, our transformative education is critical for us, um, ensuring that uh, rights of, you know, not just uh, uh, rights of nature, but also human rights are protected. Uh, in our era where we wouldn't have expected that we are regressing, uh, where, you know, so, so many of our uh, young environmentalists are struggling, to uh, you know, uh, and our uh, and our own rights are being uh, you know defending defenders of the environment are right now at stake. I think it's really important that we start thinking about how we can defend the defenders, but also protect the human rights that exist. So I think for us, some of the critical things are intergenerational equity, transforming education, human rights and rights of nature, and uh, you know, and then, and then they're like every. Uh, okay. We also have very critical points that young people are saying in every country. Like in India, we have created our own set of uh, priorities that we want uh, that that they want that we need to implement in India, as well as push for through the Indian youth to be pushed at the post 2020. Similarly, across we have done consultations on, on almost over like 30 different countries or more, and we've also done global consultations where young people are talking about critical ecosystems that need to be conserved, critical uh, you know issues issues that need to be taken into consideration. And also, you know, as Melina said, diversity, inclusion. And uh, I think the biggest thing that we as young people are talking about is how we really need to stop the same uh, in the world with what's happening with the pandemic we are in. We cannot go back to business as usual. We cannot build back better by just doing the same, more okay. of the same. We really, better actually needs to be better. And that's something we are pushing for. And we, uh, we as young people are very, very strong. And we want to be very uh, vocal about it because it is a critical year, as all of you know. And we want these next few frameworks to ensure that they have these critical points in them uh, to ensure that we uh, stop the same in the world and okay. we embrace the diversity that exists in all its forms. Thank, so, you, yeah. thank, thank you. No, thank you very much. Because um, I'm, I'm watching the clock and I know that we need to close on time. So, Hamid, uh, over to you. What's your, what's your very specific ask that you'd like the Commissioner to take away, but also this global community to hear from you? For me, as a local youth and indigenous youth in Sumatra, uh, I think the, the first uh, and the most important thing is bringing the uh, local youth into the core of uh, biodiversity conservation and how we can give the the power to the local youth like to to maintaining their customary land and also to protecting the biodiversity in the in the area where the local youth uh, live and also to empower the local youth to advocating for the biodiversity because nowadays a uh, local youth is uh, keen to advocating the biodiversity but also in the global south countries or developing countries like indonesia sometimes it's really hard uh, to to advocating the biodiversity there are some issues like criminalization of the activists and the last one is involving the the local youth in uh, uh, initiative for the conservation in 
Okay. In the other countries. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry. And apologies. Obviously, our connection was a bit poor there, but we caught most of what you have said. Now, let's move Hello. to Melina. Thank you very much. Melina. Thank you. So I think I'll be more practical. Um, I really, really, really wish like that um, the commissioner and all the other commissioners in, in the European uh, level, like since you have so much power and actually money, right, to drive change, like if you can make sure that there are social and environmental safeguards being applied to all the projects that the European Union are doing at the moment in all the partners to really like even like red list like organizations or, or countries that are not doing it and really make it a pr top priority like social safeguards with regards to inclusion like human rights protection um, participation and representativity but also like on the environment side like what kind of subsidies or like hidden um, harmful subsidies this project is causing or not so if there is a much bigger concern and like um, effort, I know it's going to be more expensive. It will require more technical like capacity to be able to do that. But this is what we need. Like people are just saying, like let's do that, let's let's protect, let's let's all of that. But that's not the matter anymore. What mm -hmm. we need to do is how mm -hmm. we are going to protect, how we are going to change the system, okay. how our economy is going to move, and those need to follow those principles of equity, inclusion, sustainability, like human rights. So I, I really hope that like um, the commissioner can take up this, this really, I mean, it's a challenge, um, but like um, the European Union can do a lot, sure. can, can foster a lot of change, you know? And those that have this power should use it <laughs> at I mean, this moment. Thank you. No, thank you for taking the opportunity. Obviously, what you know, there's something about creating a compass, isn't there, of equality, uh, rights and biodiversity. And I think that's what you need. You need that for, for, foremost in the minds of politicians. Uh, Simangeli, can I come to you very briefly in terms of what, what, you know, what's that one ask or two ask that you have in addition to what yeah. you said? Yes, I will emphasize one point and make example, equitable participation. We are in a world where we are negotiating virtually. How do we make sure that every party is able to contribute, that every stakeholder is able to contribute? If this means having means to support them with uh, data support, traveling to areas where there's connectivity, this is what needs to be done. If it means postponing a bit and having minor sessions in the middle to ensure that we have a time where we meet face to face, if that is more effective, that is what we need to do. So we need those measures in the context of negotiations. Another example, a point was made earlier on, for example, on protecting 30% by 2030. We know that most of our diversity is in areas that is managed and owned by indigenous peoples and local communities. Mm -hmm. They need to be part of that discussion. If we are saying we are going to be protecting 2030, and we know the history, for example, in a region like Africa of how these were created, those communities need to be part of that discussion of if it should happen and the how, and then it does not ex exclude their right to have access to resources that they depend on for livelihood. So that's all on my side. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, important messages about power sharing, uh, very much critically, but also think a little about uh, what we mean by access and inclusion. It's not just the usual suspects mm -hmm. and processes. Thank you very much for that. Yuta, some final comments from you before we wrap up. Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, two points uh, maybe uh, I would like to make uh, re referring to the inver inver uh, interventions. The first one is the role of the local communities. I think it's very, very important. And I take it as a takeaway of this uh, conversation. I, 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 I still try to instruct my uh, our delegations in our partner countries to really engage with the local authorities and local communities because because I think if we want to succeed it's necessary also to engage with the not only with the you know decision makers and those who are having the power but also with the local people with the local communities uh, then the second takeaway uh, is of course uh, which was also highlighted here that uh, now everybody is focusing on the recovery because we are still 
in the most of the uh, countries in the world, we are still in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. So first we need to have an exit strategy, which is vaccines, but then, you know, we need to focus on recovery. So then, of course, the question is that what kind of recovery? And from the European Union perspective, our priority is to have green, resilient, but also fair recovery. And that relates the bit and the point on the social dimension that, you know, of course, everybody is now, at least here, committed to, to, uh, uh, to strengthen uh, this uh, economically, uh, uh, economical perspective and economical sustainability angle. But at the same time, I think that we also need to take care of this social sustainability. And uh, at least I'm coming from the uh, country from the very north of Finland. And when I'm talking to people and the citizens of Finland and, and, and you know, about the climate change and, and, and what, how we need to change the way of we are living and consuming and so forth, some of the people are very defensive. They don't want to change anything in their, in their life. They are a bit care, scared in a way. They are afraid. And I think, you know, we need to provide them this kind of feeling that this necessary transition is also fair, that, you know, their feelings are also taken into account. So I'm very committed to this green transition, but at the same time, I'm also committed to invest more in human development and this social, uh, social uh, sustainability, which is, from my perspective, necessary as well. Yusuf, thank you very much. Thank you for... Thanks to you. Indeed. No, thank you all. Colleagues, Great young people. Very impressive. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, those of you, you know this very well, who have been part of this cataclysmic 18 months where we thought society could not, not possibly be in the situation that it finds itself in. And I hope that what we've witnessed is the ability to do things that were impossible, whether that was to create vaccines at scale and at speed, to create hospitals, to create a momentum of our public service staff to do things differently. Let's hope that sentiment has kind of isn't for the moment. The worst thing we'll do is to not learn the lesson of hope and opportunity and human connection. Let's not lose that. And thank you all for being with us. It's really key. And you know, one of the things about this, you know, people talk about these global online platforms, but isn't there a beauty in this that there's 10,000 of you watching this, connecting, hearing, listening to each other? You Use that power and dynamic and perhaps what you should be encouraging is create this global platform to have engagements with commissioners like Yuta on a more regular basis. It doesn't have to be once a year. It, you could demand to have more time and attention. Do that. And I, you know, leave you with two quotes that which are so overly used, but they're overly used because we don't act on them. One is from Einstein, which is about, you know, um, endlessly repeating the same process, hoping for a different outcome. Insanity. And the other from Gandhi, actually, which I haven't used for a long time because it just feels so hackneyed, <laughs> but it's so important because all of you are saying it. Be the change you seek. Uh, it's simple. It's a truism. So thank you all very much. I want to thank the Africa EU Foundation. I want to thank the Global Youth uh, Diver uh, Biodiversity Network and the European Commission and Commissioner for being here. But also, also, I'm not going to forget you, uh, the Christian, for being here with us also. I hope the recommendations are, 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 are received well. But most importantly, most importantly, I thank the young people, the 4,000 that connected with Utah, <laughs> and the thousands of you who are here on, on, you know, on, online watching. And I hope that you don't feel that your time is being wasted. I feel that what you should do is create the platform, bring Yuta back and her colleagues, and engage in this um, over time. Thank you very much. Be safe, mind your distance, and thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.